Welcome everybody. I guess we can start. Um, so today we're gonna record the seminar. Uh, it is a PhD seminar, so joint PhD seminars. Uh, I'm very pleased to have Martina Tazzioli here with us. Um, this seminar has been possible uh, through uh, the other project. Some of uh, the team members are here in the audience, and myself, I'm a PI of the, of the project. Actually, I'm not even a PI, I'm, it's just a, a beautiful collective of people. Um, and then the ITM, which is the Inter Thematic uh, Research Group on Migrations, based at SESH. And uh, a number of the uh, main uh, PhD programs at SESH. Que pós-colonialismo e cidadania global, direitos humanos e sociedades contemporâneas, democracia no século XXI, uh, uh, e international politics and conflict resolution, and governance, knowledge and innovation, governação, conhecimento e inovação. Todos estes, all these PhD pro programs are uh, very um, welcomed uh, openly and strongly. Uh, the possibility to organize this a um, seminar with Latina, who is based at Swansea University in the UK. She's a lecturer in political geography as, uh, and uh, she's the author of Spaces of Governmentality, Autonomous Migration in the Arab Uprisings, 2015, co-authored with Glenda Garelli of Tunisia as a revolutionized space of migration, 2016, and co-editor of Foucault and the uh, History of Our Present, 2015. Um, then she uh, co-edited uh, Foucault and the Making of Subjects, 2016. Uh, she is a co-founder of the journal uh, Materiali Foucaultiani and part of the editorial board of Radical Philosophy uh, Journal, based in the UK, right? Um, she is also a member of Migrant Europe Obs Observatory on Euro Europe's Borders, uh, which is constituted by European international researchers, lawyers, and activists. Uh, her talk today is uh, titled Crimes of Solidarity and the Borders of Europe, the Mobile Infrastructures of Migration Support and the Fracturing of Humanitarianism. The seminar is going to last more or less one hour. Um, uh, any time she said, any time people want to interrupt, to have any concept uh, clarified, please. Um, and uh, we're going to have a little break in the middle. And then, of course, a question up uh, to uh, 6 p.m. We have plenty of time for, for questions and discussions. So again, welcome everybody. I've got a list for the PhD students that are going to circulate right now. And what else? Uh, that's it. So let's get started. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Gaia, for the invitation. And thank you for all of you to have me here. Uh, I just simplify the title a bit because it was quite complicated. Um, and what I present today is uh, a work that I have been doing with um, uh, professor based at Carleton University, William Walters. So we wrote a paper together. So what I present today is, 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 is more or less this paper plus it's a combination of this paper and a shorter paper that I wrote in Radical Philosophy entitled Crimes of Solidarity, Migration and Containment Through Rescue. And my talk today I mean, speaks about migration but the focus both of the paper and of this short intervention is not migration per se, but is rather an attempt to reconceptualize solidarity, which is a notion that every one of us use, I guess, or at least uh, that widespread um, in the newspapers, right? In particular, at this moment in Europe, um, this debate around should we uh, should we act in solidarity with the migrants, but also with other subject or not, uh, and that, however, is quite under-theorized, so is a notion that requires to be unpacked and rethought, right, also in the light of the most recent events and of the ongoing uh, so-called economic crisis on the one hand and refugee crisis on the other. So the angle, the analytical angle that we use in the paper uh, to rethink solidarity is precisely the ongoing and increasing criminalization 
of solidarity, of solidarity networks in support of migration. So this is the overall topic of the talk, and please interrupt, as Gaia said, any time you want. If I'm saying, if I take for granted something that you don't know, also at the level of like uh, geographical location or uh, episodes that I mentioned, please ask me, right? So let's start from here, or better, let's start from another map. So I'm based in a geography department, and for this reason, I'm not a geographer, but I try to use maps. This is a basic map just to give you an idea because I don't know how many of you uh, are aware of the kind of uh, journeys that migrants will land, um, mostly in southern Europe, in southern Italy, sorry, Sicily and Lampedusa, uh, undertake in order to reach uh, northern <coughs> Europe and in particular to reach France. So this is the city of Ventimiglia, which is located, is on the Italian side and is located uh, 10 kilometers away from the French border. And Ventimiglia is a very important geographical marker for all migrants who want to reach France, right? Ventimiglia, everybody knows of Ventimiglia, uh, all the migrants who arrive know that Ventimiglia is the main like, geographical uh, point and the main border actually from the moment when they land that they need uh, to uh, cross in order to reach France. So this is just to give you an idea of the geographical context. And this is a more specific map. Uh, so let's start from this. Uh, this is Ventimiglia, so northern Italy at the border with France. And what happened? So when Ventimiglia, when uh, did Ventimiglia become a border? Ventimiglia became a border in 2011, actually. 2011, when uh, thousands of Tunisian migrants reached the Italian coast in the aftermath of the Tunisian Revolution, right? They landed in Lampedusa and they wanted to reach France. So at that moment, in April 2011, France suspended Schengen, the Schengen Agreement, so re established border controls at the borders with Italy. So Ventimiglia became a border, right, for the migrants. Uh, for some subject on so a racialized border. Then, again, in 2015, with the increased number of arrivals in Italy and uh, with many migrants uh, who wanted to reach France, many others wanted to reach Germany, um, France suspended Schengen again. So in 2015, in May 2015, uh, the French-Italian borders became a real tough Hard frontier for many migrants. So anyway, in the first month of 2015, migrants managed to cross basically via train uh, after many attempts. Since 2016, this is no longer possible. So because the police come on the train at the border and catch all those people who are non-white, right? It's a very racialized uh, policy operation that goes on on a daily basis on the train between Ventimiglia and Menton, and so migrants try to cross on foot, and many of them try to cross um, on the Alps, right? Arriving in this valley called Roya, Roya Valley. Uh, this is a valley where locals, French citizens, provided, start to provide in 2016 uh, a lot of support, right? Um, in favor of the migrants in transit. This other slide shows another crossing point, so a bit northern. Uh, migrants also try to cross. This is this Italian city of Clavier, which is a French name, but it's still on the Italian side, and the Italian city of Bardonecchia. From here, in particular uh, since um, the end of 2016, migrants also try to cross because uh, the, the, cr the crossing point to the Raya Valley is still quite difficult. So they try to cross here in order to arrive to the French cities of Briançon. This is a very difficult uh, crossing point on the Alps, in particular uh, in winter, because there is the snow, right? So many migrants died also uh, last winter, and uh, however, these deaths have been quite invisibilized. So unlike uh, Mediterranean migrant deaths, right? or unlike the border spectacle that has been produced 
by the Italian and the European authorities in Lampedusa, um, here is a much more invisibilized border crossing point. So this is the geographical location where uh, this work is situated and where I've conducted uh, recently my, if you want, field work. Now, uh, in order to understand uh, this topic, so why uh, solidarity has been uh, increasingly criminalized, solidarity uh, with the migrants in transit, uh, I think we need to uh, take a step back and understanding uh, what is going on at these borders. So uh, usually uh, these, the, the, the French Italian borders is considered Yes, a tough border where migrants are pushed back, and so many scholars, many activists tend to reproduce the image of the fortress Europe, right? Of Europe as a frontier where migrants uh, hardly manage to cross. Uh, this is partially true, uh, and there is a lot of violence at these borders, but this doesn't mean that migrants are fully blocked, right? On the contrary, uh, one of the arguments of my current research is that migrants are also governed, disciplined, by being kept on the move, right? So by being forced to constantly move, uh, they are constantly pushed back and forth uh, by the French uh, from the border and then they try again, right? So uh, this is a strategy to exhaust the migrants. Migrants get tired, right? If you have to do the same journey many times, if you have to spend money again, uh, so mobility, in, to, to say in a very, like in two words, is not only an object of government, something that states try to discipline, to manage, but also a technology of government, meaning by that uh, a way, a tools that states use for disciplining, channeling, and exhausting the migrants, right? Um, so, as you can see why this is important. Because uh, one of my arguments is that these crimes of solidarity, so the fact that uh, states like France and Italy, but also others, uh, criminalize and um, attack to some, uh, many of these activist networks, uh, is not, does not depend on the gesture, per se, of bringing help to the migrants. So what is punished is not the very fact that migrants in the end manage to cross, because most of them manage to cross anyway, although at a very high cost, high price, uh, also uh, both physically and economically speaking, uh, but because these solidarity networks uh, manage to build temporary uh, infrastructure of support, of refuge, right? So they managed to uh, counter um, the, the spaces of control and violence and exclusion produced by the state, right? So beyond helping migrants in crossing the borders, these uh, locals, and then I will explain in a minute who are these people, uh, managed to uh, desecuritize space, right? And to counter this logic of the hostile environment. I don't know if you are familiar with this expression, but this is very much used, for instance, by the British authorities. They really put this expression in all documents, uh, most recent documents about migration. So we want to create hostile, we have to create a hostile environment. Migrants should not be merely blocked in their mobility, but they should also be uh, troubled in their possibility to stay and to build spaces of life. Calais, for instance, uh, in northern France, uh, is uh, famously one of the spaces where the UK government start to implement, to enact this hostile environment. It's a, it's a space where they started to test this technology, these uh, practices through which an, an environment becomes hostile for the migrants. Uh, so, who are these? people who have been helping uh, the migrants at the French Italian borders, but overall across Europe. I think we can't generalize because, for instance, in Germany, there is a quite different experience of refugee welcome, right, uh, that took place in particular in 2015, 
now the situation, I don't know if you have been following the most recent news, but has changed quite a lot. Um, in France and in Italy, um, what is interesting is that uh, there is a mix of proper activists, so to speak, so people who have been uh, engaged for long time uh, in no borders activities and in migration support activities, but also locals uh, who are, have other experience, for instance, who have been engaged with uh, the church, with um, Catholic uh, services, um, and other who just mobilize as individual citizens without belonging to any uh, specific organization. Um, so this is the case both in Italy and uh, in France. <laughs> There is a mistake. <laughs> uh, okay, it's politicizing. <laughs> there is a typo. Um, so, um, okay, this is the picture, right? Uh, the, the analytical angle uh, that we use in this paper uh, and that I'm currently interested in um, to unpack solidarity, to understand what this uh, solidarity uh, is about and why these solidarity practices disturb, trouble state authorities. So why it has become so tricky, so dodgy to give food to the migrants or to um, uh, provide a shelter for one night to the migrants, right? Something that until two years ago was considered a humanitarian gesture, right? Um, uh, over the last two years, this has become like uh, criminalized also through the use of national laws and European laws, the so-called 2002 European Directives, we uh, will discuss this later, uh, and also through more like through police and administrative measures, right? Without any, uh, also we, uh, beyond the law, uh, the police block these people and try to um, to disturb, to ha to obstruct their activities. So why? Uh, this gesture have become criminalized. First of all, we think that uh, in order to um, critically engage with this notion of solidarity, we need to trace a genealogy of uh, solidarity practices in these European spaces. So until now, solidarity has been conceptualized and described uh, in the literature, both in migration literature and in political theory, uh, as more like in spatial terms, right? So we speak about transborder solidarity, for instance. Uh, we speak about uh, solidarity beyond borders. Uh, but what remains partially overshadowed is the role of temporality. So what I mean by that? The fact that solidarity is not something that erupts into the present, as a, just an immediate reaction to um, a, a, a context of, a, to an hostile context, politically speaking, but is also the result of what we call in the paper sedimentation of experiences of struggles and solidarity uh, that have shaped these spaces. To put it more concretely, let's go back to these maps. So, just to give you an example, is not by chance, uh, I think, that in this valley, Italian people, Italian people some Italian people, right? Uh, uh, we can't generalize. It's a very uh, critical moment in Italy, but also in France. And uh, in northern Italy, um, the right wing uh, is quite strong at the moment, in particular also on the mountains in this zone, but in this zone where there is such a tension against the migrants, such a conflict, conflictual uh, situation against the migrants, people got mobilized in this valley, which is called Susa Valley. This Susa Valley uh, has a particular peculiar history. So the Susa Valley has a history of resistance against the German occupation in the early 40s, and then a history of struggle against the building of infrastructures across the valley, uh, like the motorway, for instance, and more recently, since the early 90s, the history of struggle against the high-speed train, 
the so-called not have movement. Uh, so it's trains is supposed to go from Turin to Paris. Um, so among these people, many also mobilized recently in support of the migrants. And this is something that I started to realize only going there and doing interviews with this person. So many of them are not no borders at all. They have no experience with the migrants. Um, they are 60 years old, um, and many are also part of like Catholic movements. So I asked, so why you decided to get involved in this kind of hidden clandestine activities, right? Um, and they told me, well, I've been part of the Not, Not A Movement. For me, this is a social justice issue. I struggle for the migrants because in this moment, the struggle around migration and to support these people who want to cross is one of the main struggles if we want uh, to, to, be, to remain like Europeans, if we want that Europe still makes sense and if we want that even our country, Italy, uh, is still alive, right? So I think this is uh, quite interesting. And at the same time in France, uh, across the border, the Val Royale is considered uh, a valley of people uh, who since the 60s, the 70s, sorry, uh, mobilized, considered a sort of, if you want, communist valley. Um, and even here, uh, many uh, from these local communities have supported the migrants. And one of the most emblematic case is the case of this cloth man, Cédric Heroux, Cédric Heroux uh, who in 2016 uh, has been accused for helping migrants, Eritrean migrants, to cross from Vietnamia. Um, he has been under trial and here is 15, up to 15 years jail uh, and 3,000 euros of fees. Then in the end, he did so that after one year, uh, he has been, I mean, uh, they decided that he could not uh, be punished uh, with jails, but still he has to pay a huge amount of money and he's still tracked by the police constantly. The same happened to an Italian uh, woman, a 32 years old woman, who was living in Nice um, uh, and who tried to help, who helped actually many migrants to cross, but also she provided safe shelter, temporary shelters to the migrants. And I can mention many other cases, also old women, French women, who have been accused for allowing the migrants to recharge their phone, right? Um, so the first, our first point is that we need to uh, rethink solidarity uh, by bringing in temporality, right? That the, the, the solidarity is a specialized concept why uh, through this temporal lens we can understand how this memory of the struggle um, have been reactivated into the present. And if you think about that, this is also the case of, so I think it is a, a, a broader point. Um, so if you think about places what, uh, that are usually called like border zone, like Calais, Ventimiglia, but even Lampedusa, Lesbos, Eidomeni, the, the border between Macedonia and Greece, these are all spaces that, um, if you want, have a short, quite short history in our memory, right? Uh, but, but that really shaped the European space because, because of the media tension uh, on it and also because of the extreme violence exercised on the migrants and also because of a, a very important history of migrant struggles in these spaces. But there is no memory of these spaces as spaces of control and migration in the official archives of Europe. So I think um, it would be interesting to retrace uh, the existence of these vanishing ephemeral spaces because, for instance, if you take a domain, the border between, uh, which is located at the border between Greece and Macedonia, where many migrants cross into the Syrians cross in 2015. Now this space is, is not longer considered frontier, right? Because the Balkan route is closed, and so there is no media attention there. Our second point is that um, if you want, the, uh, 
we should undertake a sort of politic, what we call political genealogy of solidarity. Um, and we refer to the work of the feminist uh, Chandra Mohanty, uh, who uh, in, in her work, um, in particular in the, art, in the article under Western Eyes, um, points to the fact that solidarity should not be conceived only uh, by looking at the alliances between uh, the, the governed and between the among the victims, among those who are governed, but also uh, in terms of uh, what all these govern as in common. So about, if you want, this uh, strong points that connect uh, these people who are governed by different but similar, um, but similar laws and policies and modes of exploitation. Um, so, in the end, uh, the work in uh, migration studies, I don't know how many of you work on migration. Okay, not so many. One. Uh, so, I don't know if you are familiar with this literature, but uh, in this literature, uh, the analysis on solidarity try to remain very much stick to a liberal framework of what solidarity is, right? without questioning, for instance, the kind of asymmetries that sometimes what we call solidarity, solidarity practices involve, right? Um, if, we, uh, if the subjects are at play are uh, governed through uh, racialized and uh, differential uh, modes. Um, so in the migration literature, I think we can't find so many helpful analytical tools, and um, what we contend in the paper is that, for instance, in this literature that maybe you came across with, in the so-called citizenship studies literature, so if you work on citizenship, maybe you have encountered these words, um, I don't know if you have ever heard, like the work of Anginizing, Peter Nyers, Anne McNevin, so they do uh, brilliant uh, analysis on citizenship, but their account of solidarity tends to be very punctual. They don't uh, give an account of the temporal dimension of solidarity. So they just focus on the moment when migrants act, when migrants erupt into the political space, and uh, the whole focus is on agency, right? So we try to bring in a different literature to reconceptualize uh, solidarity. The third point, and then maybe and you, can, you can ask me a question if, you, if I'm going too fast, is about, um, so I mentioned this need to uh, think, to uh, account for the sedimentation of practical knowledges and struggles over time. Um, however, we are in the paper, this is not an easy, an easy fail, right? Um, it's very difficult to uh, reactivate over time and in a very different political and geographical context this memory of the struggle, but also to exchange knowledges. So what activists and locals who got mobilized experience is precisely this difficulty of uh, uh, exchanging what they are doing because the situation is very difficult if you, sorry, it's very different if you take Ventimiglia or Calais, for instance. In Ventimiglia, migrants really try to pass as soon as possible, while in Calais, they know that unfortunately, they always remain, they tend to remain stranded for months, for instance. Um, so, uh, is a, is a difficult uh, issue, this kind of uh, mod, uh, way of sharing uh, concrete experiences, and we use, um, we build, sorry, on uh, works, uh, in particular, um, let's say, promoted by um, um, Vasily Tsianos and his colleagues on the mobile commons. So, uh, in the initial title, I we use the I use the the word infrastructure. So, uh, we suggested that these activities, this shared knowledge, produce sort of mobile infrastructure of support. But actually, we decided that infrastructure is a too fixed notion, right? 
um, infrastructure give you an idea of something that is quite stable, while we prefer to um, uh, engage with this notion of uh, mobile commons that are uh, that travel over time and across spaces. Um, and this is something very difficult. So also this translation of the experiences across spaces is something that is uh, very difficult to happen. Um, so just to ask you if I stop a minute because I want to ask if you have any question until now. Can you have one that I thought about wait, uh, waiting for the last session of questions? Sorry? I don't, I don't know. Are you supposed to make questions now? Or in the end? Because you said that you whatever you feel like and it's important for you to understand better. Yeah, if it's something unclear. That... No, no, it's not. Okay. Um, so this is can I just explain this most we are very exposed to the problems of the South. Uh, it's one of the few environments out there to say in Portugal these questions can be tackled. So I, I guess most people are, although we don't know all of the literature, I would dare to say that most of the literature from the global south and the sensibilities are present so it's we know what we are talking about. We understand. Okay. Because it's a different geographical location, right? So uh, it's not, uh, so it's sometimes to notice details if you are not familiar with the French Italian border context. Um, so this is a, a church, a room inside a church occupied by locals in the city of Clavia. So at the French Italian border on the Italian side, uh, this room, um, is, sorry, this room inside the church has been occupied against the will of the priest. Um, the position of the church is very ambivalent at the moment in Italy. So on the one hand, the church is officially supporting uh, migrants, refugees, um, more than in the past for sure. But at the same time, there are also the local churches, and they have certain autonomies um, and so in this case the priest uh, has been against the occupation and the church this priest uh, has been trying to evict this place since March 2018 when the activists occupied this room. So this is quite um, funny uh, what is written here I don't know if you understand the French but it's like at Jesus place precisely because uh, the priest was against so they try to uh, play with the fact that the church is a sanctuary space and they say uh, libertà di movimento is like freedom of movement for everyone, uh, occupy church against every border. Um, and this occupation has been going on since March and, at the mo and for the moment it has not been evicted. Also because there is, so the, the priest um, called the Italian authorities to evict the place but at the same time, the Italian authorities, despite the right-wing government, has no interest in um, visibilizing in, at the moment this part of the frontier of the border, because here the migrants manage to cross on the slide, and Italy is very happy if migrants go to France, uh, while in Ventimiglia, both France and Italy try to create the case, right? They try to... Um, show that there is a crisis uh, at that border. Uh, also, if even in Ventimiglia now, the number of migrants stranded there is quite small. Uh, so we are speaking about 200 migrants, something like that. It differs from time to time. Here, every night, every day, around between 30 and 40 migrants arrive uh, from the city of Turin they take the regional trains to the city of Ulx and then they catch a bus uh, and they stop in Claviere, where they are, they are hosted by uh, a small group of locals, right? Uh, not all locals, it, I, uh, don't get me wrong, the, the whole village is split between those who support the migrants on the sly or in an open way and those who are against the refugees, right? Um, so activists, uh, I, I use this term activists because also in the case of those who have not been involved in the border movement, 
in this moment they are really exposing themselves to help the refugees. It doesn't matter their background. So if they are, uh, they come from Catholic movements, if they come from uh, the Notav, if they are just individual citizen who decided to help for their own reason. Uh, and they state very clearly, the snow is not an emergency, the problems are not the mountains, the problem is the frontier, right? Uh, so they try to de-exceptionalize the environment. There is this production of the Alps as deadly frontier, but this is, they say, okay, this is our space, is our environment. This space, of course, can be a deadly frontier because it's during winter there is snow, but migrants were not supposed to come through here, right? You have to be to be equipped very well in order to cross, and you have to, um, I, I would never be able to cross this mountain uh, in winter, right? You, if you don't have like skills as an alpine guide, it's impossible. Um, it's very likely that you die or that uh, um, you experience serious problems. Um, so they uh, try to um, flash out uh, this, and uh, of course their presence in the village is more and more contested. Um, and they have been asked to leave the place, but for the moment there is this ambivalent reaction on the part of the authorities. While in places like Ventimiglia, where the frontier is more visible, there is a sheer criminalization of all activists. So even giving the, fa the very gesture of giving uh, food has been banished for three months by the municipality of Ventimiglia, uh, last year, so there was no, there was, so giving food to the migrants was not allowed, right? Um, then this, banish, uh, this ban has been removed, but still uh, you can be accused of uh, supporting uh, illegal migrant transit, right? So both France and Italy use these national laws that are very ambivalent and ambiguous because uh, there is no a clear distinction between helping migrants for profit or helping migrants for free, right? Um, and this ambivalence is also part of the 2002 uh, EU directive, facilitation directives, that states use, build on, to criminalize activists. So supporting, uh, facilitating, this is the, cor the exact verb, facilitating the entrance and the stay the permanence of non-authorized migrants is considered uh, something that, can, that is subjected to penalty. Then it's up to the single member states to decide which penalty, right? But facilitating the entrance, you, mean it, you see that is a very ambi ambiguous expression, right? Because facilitation for, uh, for free or because you believe that frontiers should not exist is quite different from um, asking migrants money to pass. Um, so I think that it's interesting to understand these ambiguities of the law and how states place on the edge of the law, right? Um, however, just a clarification, um, I think that there is a, I mean, we can't say that to be criminalized is our gesture per se. So in part, yes, so very basic gesture that until now were considered humanitarian gesture, giving food, uh, providing a shelter, allowing the migrants to take a rest, is considered a crime, right? Um, however, uh, our argument in the paper is that to be criminalized are less the gestures per se than the fact that all these actors, doesn't matter if they are Catholic organization, activists, individual citizen, they act partially outside the official channels of state support, right? So nobody thinks in Italy that the Red Cross is a criminal actor or a smuggler. Nobody considers the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees uh, an organization that facilitates the entrance of the migrants. While other NGOs, for instance, if you think about today Doctors Without Borders, 
are, have been accused of being part of these uh, migrant supporting networks in a different way, of course, than uh, the locals in this small village. <coughs> but there is this being partially outside, being partially independent, building something different from just the top-down humanitarianism provided, uh, although more in a more and more basic way by the state, right? So I think, yeah. Could we say that, for instance, uh, what is criminalized at the end is the autonomy of this kind of behavior, which is uh, individual or collective practice that builds not just a practice in itself, but also a discourse that can contest also, let's say, the monopoly of not just the state, but let's say the main agencies that control and deal and govern migration. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I use in, in the paper is also in fact this semi-autonomous, of course they can't be totally autonomous because for instance here in the in this zone, in this area, um, of, of course they, need, they constantly need to negotiate in order to be there since they are not totally clandestine. The authorities know that the activists are in the, in the church and also that uh, small NGOs of doctors, uh, Africa, uh, sorry, Rainbow for Africa is based in the city of Bardonecchia. So these organizations need to negotiate their presence, but at the same time, they manage to be partially autonomous and also, as you said, to use a discourse to, that in this moment is troubles the state. But a discourse that is also okay for us doesn't matter if these people are illegal. We are doctors, we need to save life. This in this moment is problematic. That is not a universal thing, right? But in this moment is problematic. And it's quite interesting that in the same valley there are these quite different experiences. So in Clavier, this legal occupation of the church, in Bardonecchia, a small NGOs that the <coughs> municipality allowed to uh, do its activities uh, very close to the I mean, room, close to the rail station. So migrants take the train from Turin regional train to Bardonecchia, they get off the train, otherwise they are stopped at the border, and these organizations of doctors, they are just doctors, they are not activists, uh, help them, uh, give them like a shelter for the night, and they, they check if the migrants have like uh, mental health issues, or just even more urgent issues, like physical uh, arms. Um, and and then the migrants try to cross the day after, right? So they can't help more than that, but it's considered already a problematic fail. I mean, I can mention what happened in March. So I was there to do my research, and uh, by chance, 10 French policemen erupted in the room of these NGOs while I was there, um, and they did this act just to put pressure on this small organization by saying, okay, we, so they enter illegally the Italian territory, right? The, Italian, the French police, they enter this small room in Bardonecchia just to say, okay, we want to check what you, what you are doing. They wanted to take, like, they, want, um, they, they force the migrants uh, on the train to take a drug test, right? But this was just an excuse to put pressure on these small NGOs. And also to say to the Italian, look, you have to control the border, right? You can't let the migrants get in. Can I just ask a question? Did the organization file a complaint against the French government? A uh, complaint against the French government? Yes. Yes, there is, there is a trial going on at the moment in Italy um, that has been made by the Italian authorities against the French because apart from the migrants, they did something illegally, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, this is part of the diplomatic political issues. They erupted in the room because they wanted to say to the Italian, look, you have to check it. Uh, the small organization, yes, they like wrote like uh, press release against the, 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 the eruption of the French, but they could not do more than that. Um, so, um, However, stay back, uh, I think that in this, so by using this word solidarity, we should not think that solidarity is just like a neutral word, that is a word that is used only by these uh, uh, activists uh, that, are, that work in support of the migrants, 
Solidarity, as you probably notice, is also a word that is uh, crucial in the European Union text, right? Uh, also in those documents that uh, speak about migration. So solidarity is a notion, a catchword, I would say, that uh, is crucial in the uh, EU Dublin regulation, for instance. Um, so uh, solidarity is, uh, we use this term, so it has been rebordered by Europe by the European Union has been appropriated and twisted by the European authorities not to speak about the need of the citizen to help the migrants, to help the refugees, uh, but about the need of the states to cooperate among themselves to manage, to handle the problem, right? So the migrants become not the object of solidarity, but those against which this solidarity should be uh, acted, <laughs> actualized uh, by uh, the state. Uh, so I think it's quite interesting and it's a quite slippery terrain at the moment to use this word on an institutional level. Um, and for instance, you find this word also uh, for uh, in the EU documents that speak about crisis, different kind of crisis, environmental crisis, disasters, migration crisis. Um, and however, uh, so we think that is precisely in this ambivalent uh, terrain that it makes sense to repoliticize solidarity. So solidarity is not per se a notion that uh, is a guarantee of a specific political view on migration, but is something that in this moment specifically uh, is a, an interesting uh, terrain. And also because the European Union uh, clearly state that there is a crisis of solidarity, so that there is at the moment a problem of crisis of solidarity among the states, in particular between the southern European states, the Mediterranean countries, and the northern states of Europe that, that do not want to collaborate with, uh, with, that, with those states for um, um, taking the, like sharing the so-called refugee burden, right? So it's always in relation to this refugee burden that the notion of solidarity uh, is uh, used. So um, what, what we ask, what, the, the question that we raise in the paper is what does the criminalization of solidarity tell us? So why is it interesting to understand also uh, the restructuring of um, like the, the spaces of struggle in Europe on the one hand and the need to rethink solidarity per se. We think that first uh, we need to, um, there is an interesting articulation going on between humanitarianism and solidarity. So for instance, if I ask you what is the difference? Also not in academic terms, just if I tell you like humanitarian action and if I tell you solidarity action, act, act in solidarity with uh, uh, when I think about solidarity, maybe it's too political, but I think uh, on creating a political we that is not uh, uh, without uh, asymmetries uh, or power relation, but is, uh, I mean, a connection based not just on the needs uh, of uh, the ones that we help, but also on the needs of the one that help. So it's it's a collective struggle at the end. Humanitarianism is like more um, a Western way of uh, conceiving charity for the poorest one, uh, the one that needs help, and it's not a a connection between. Uh, uh, yeah. The term humanitarianism sounds also a bit more top down than solidarity in general. It seems less. Conceptualize. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I agree. <coughs> so I, I think that um, you might, so is, historically speaking, you might add. Uh, yeah, I also wanted to add that humanitarianism sounds also much more Eurocentric than solidarity, uh, which is used more widely. I think while with uh, it, it sounds more connected to humanism <coughs> and therefore to, to Europe. The, the European project. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. 
Uh, I think that the European discourse, the institutional European discourse, uh, moves from solidarity to social cohesion. So nowadays, uh, the, the, the first picture that you gave regarding the, the presence of world solidarity in the institution, European institutional discourse, nowadays doesn't apply, and, uh, and we have to think about why and why why. Uh, so uh, this is not uh, <laughs> but I want to add this point because uh, the way uh, how it is nowadays maybe the even world solidarity is not the same as the, the initial approach. No, so, oh, yes, I was thinking about the fact that of course in terms of uh, structuring, in terms of organization, solidarity is peer to peer, supposed to be peer to peer, and humanitarianism is of course uh, yeah. Uh, Button, let's say, but also in terms of how it's structured, it's quite different. Which doesn't mean that solidarity doesn't imply power relations, of course. But humanitarianism, as Christina was saying, it comes from a very particular ideological core, which has to do with who is providing humanitarian support, help, or whatever. Solidarity is supposed to be between subjects who possibly experience the same situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to add a bit of confusion of the concepts. Uh, a few minutes ago, you were uh, telling us about all these concepts of solidarity and how you you, you said it. Um, to um, in the, and they, I I feel maybe it's a bit limited, so you use other fields to look at this concept. I was thinking about asking. What do you think about the concept? How does the concepts of empathy and trust, for instance, studied by I mean, like this, like the people who are looking at emotions, linked mm -hmm. to I R and all this, how this concept of empathy links to solidarity? Maybe it's something for mm -hmm. to be considered or not. I don't know. How, have you thought about it? How empathy and build trust has been used, for instance, in international relations fields? For uh, uh, conflict resolution, mm -hmm. uh, how and also understand specifically the some specific conflict, how this empathy and trust could be applied to the concept of solidarity in a, such a practical way. Yeah, um, no, just to um, uh, uh, support what you are saying uh, in terms of the distinction between solidarity and humanitarianism, uh, I agree with you that. Uh, as you all said there is, although solidarity always entails power relations because uh, there are no relations without power relations, but uh, in a, in the, what characterizes humanitarianism is precisely uh, these asymmetries between lives that, is, uh, that humanitarianism builds upon and reproduce. And so, this distinction that Didier Fassan says between uh, those who save and those who are saved, right? That is constantly replicated, both at sea, the sea is most, the most extreme space, uh, but also in these um, this other uh, sites. So if you go and look at how uh, the Red Cross operates in refugee camps, it's quite clear that they, are, they put themselves in this position of, okay, I give you something and uh, you should be also, um, you should be uh, happy that I gave you something and uh, there is no, if you want, no relationship, no, uh, with, with the, the person in terms of um, like sharing uh, also uh, a project, right? Or uh, uh, that can be supporting migrants' uh, will to, uh, to, to go to France. But the other important thing is neutrality, right? That humanitarianism historically has been conceived as a neutral action, although uh, is not neutral, of course. Is a political. Is a. Is always a politis, political act, uh, way of acting. Uh, this idea of taking stand for those who are in need of, and taking stand in such a way. So, uh, providing help. Um, while, what characterized this uh, small uh, or like even bigger solidarity networks is the fact that all these people. Uh, do not uh, think to be like neutral. They, in, a, in different, with different languages, because of course there are there is heterogeneity of languages, 
So if you consider how a Catholic organization and how uh, uh, no, not have uh, uh, persons support the migrants, there are different languages, but there is this idea, okay, I, su I, I struggle for social justice and these people should not be uh, in this position of coming in this way, right? So, uh, to put it very shortly, um, these solidarity networks all share the idea, if you interview the single people, uh, that migrants should not be there in that way, in, that, in those extreme situations, right? So the fact that migrants come by boat, right, come by boat in that unsafe way, is something that these people involved in different manners in this project do not accept. Say, we are here, but should not, we should not be here, right? It's not normal that migrants should cross, uh, across, should, uh, risk to die at sea, should risk to cross the mountains. What humanitarian organization, established humanitarian organization, they don't question this kind of uh, system, right? Or at least they don't question radically. So if you think about the UNHCR claim for humanitarian channels, they don't say the visa system should not exist, right? They say we should find a way for allowing some that of the migrants that we select to come in a safe way, right? So this is uh, how, how today we, we, we experience this difference. However, I think that um, there is an interesting, also ambiguous terrain. Uh, so the fact that this also humanitarian gestures, because uh, if you think about this, the gesture of really providing food to the migrants in Calais, or the struggles that in Calais took place for putting showers, public showers for allowing the migrants uh, to have a shower, and the municipality refused, and many people in, from Calais were, have been struggling for this. So this, this is something, is an activity that is, a, is an act that even an established NGOs or international organization could struggle for, right? Like the Red Cross. But in that specific site, struggling for the shower was considered problematic. So I think that this, this interesting articulation between, on the one hand, a language and also a goal that is different from humanitarianism and the fact that these people do not put themselves in the position of being the saviors, right? But on the other, they, they, well, if we look at what they do, in part, is not so far from the gesture per se of giving the food. So it's interesting how these uh, very gestures are transcribed in a different, not only narrative, but also in a different political space. Um, so some scholars have recently spoke about this politicization of humanitarianism. That doesn't mean that humanitarianism usually is not political, but means that today it has become a terrain, an open terrain of struggle. So, uh, if you think about, I will, I will can speak more about this later, about Doctors Without Borders being attacked, overtly attacked by the states for rescuing the migrants. So rescuing a person who is about to die is an obligation according to the international law and is also a humanitarian act. But this act is becoming problematic, is becoming something that states uh, do not uh, want the NGOs to do. So there is this <coughs> politicization of humanitarianism and I think that it's very, it's interesting how it is, it has become difficult also to trace a neat boundaries between the two. Um, so between the act on the one end of NGOs that, I mean I'm, I'm not particularly sympathetic, not, not at all, you know, personally <laughs> with NGOs, right? Uh, with the, the NGOs way of operating with migrants uh, but of course there are differences among the different the, 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 the NGOs and the way in which today NGOs uh, have been under attack. Some NGOs, a less established one, while others are totally inside the system. So this is the second point that um, this critical account of solidarity and humanitarianism, articulation between the two, should not uh, lead us to think that there is now an opposition between states, 
states and security intervention on the one hand, security approach and humanitarian intervention on the other. Rather, I think is more because this articulation between humanitarianism and security way of acting is still in place. If you go to Lesbos, to the Greek island of Lesbos, if you, if you go to Lampedusa, you see this on a daily basis. So migrants are checked and identified by so-called humanitarian action actors, sorry, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the Red Cross, who are completely inside the system and they are at the same time checked by the police. And the two actors share data, share information, and they uh, control that the migrants do not escape uh, from the island. So there is no change on this level, but there is, if you want, multiple split within this field of humanitarianism because certain actors, like again, for instance, of Dr. Sidat Walters, I think there are many others, but I mention this because I know that it's a quite well known actors decided implicitly to take a stand. So the fact that you expose yourself and you say, for me today, there is no other choice than saving lives. Or, uh, uh, okay, I go to the French Italian borders and I uh, support the migrants uh, as a doctor uh, at, uh, in the city of Bardonecchia, is becoming in a more implicit way than the no borders, uh, a mode of support, direct support, because if you allow the migrants not to be, not to die because you, uh, you can like uh, uh, allow the migrants to take a rest and to, uh, and, and not to be injured to some extent, you also facilitate the crossing. It's one of the way in which the crossing is facilitated and you avoid the migrants uh, as, uh, for instance, um, people who want to be paid uh, to cross because you indicate the, uh, your young migrants in the forest, right? So this is one of the daily activities, for instance, done both by these doctors and by the activists in the church. So they help the migrants showing them maps about how to cross the mountains. The activists do this in a more explicit way, uh, the, the others do that in a, like, in a more hidden way because they don't want to be evicted uh, from that uh, small uh, room sorry, in, in uh, Bardonic. Um, and the third point is that this criminalization of solidarity <coughs> is telling, we think, of uh, this constant attempt to undermine migrant spaces of life, what in France the migrants themselves in Calais call, call lieu de vie, so space of life. In the jungle of Calais, there were these um, uh, tents uh, where migrants wrote, this is a lieu de vie. Uh, lieu de vie is like a space where you can build temporary life, where you can create a relatively autonomous space, right? Um, and uh, so this criminalization concerns, if you want, these temporary transversal alliances between migrants and non-migrants, and also um, yeah, any, any attempt to build a collective subject out of that. So when there is, even a, on a potential level, the possibility that uh, migrant, a migrant collective is recognized as a political subject, as a political actor, this is immediately criminalized, and in particular where there are white Europeans supporting this. Um, Okay, uh, that said, I think that is in, I mean, I think that uh, is not, this analysis is not enough and that um, there is a need also of problematizing the kind of discourse that has been uh, made by uh, some NGOs, some human rights organization against crimes of solidarity. So what I explained until now is sort of picture that tend to distinguish between the good white Europeans who save the migrants for free and the supposedly bad smugglers who ask money the migrants. Um, I think this, uh, that this is also like the, the next step to take, right? Uh, if not politically because of the slippery terrain that in this moment on this criminalization of solidarity is but at least on an analytical level, theoretical level, uh, which kind of discourse do we want, which kind of counter discourse do we want to do? 
around this criminalization of solidarity. One is, okay, we want to show that uh, there is a part, okay, a minority of the European society that work, uh, that struggle together in different ways, from very basic gesture to the more exposed one with the migrants. Uh, but on the other, there is also, I think, a need to, uh, so the, there, there is an implicit risk of reproposing this, this distinction between the bad smugglers and the good non smugglers, right, accused of being smugglers, and also reproposing these asymmetries, to put it shortly, between the northern shore and the southern shore of the Mediterranean. So, um, when I mean, third, let's say, citizens from non European countries help migrants to cross, the Mediterranean, uh, being paid or not being paid, they are depicted in a very different way from like the no borders at the French-Italian border or from uh, the doctors who have el been helping them. So I think is a, uh, I don't have an answer, but I think that um, also at the level of, yeah, mainly of the narrative uh, used um, in this moment, for instance, by critical legal scholars and by big by by NGOs, are that try to decriminalize these acts of solidarity. We should reconsider what we want to say, right? So the fact that so that we mentioned this, that we criminalize this very word of smuggling, right? This facilitation of transit, that of course many times involves money. So even in order to cross this. Is like uh, through this uh, relatively short passage from Italy to, to France, many migrants have to pay, right? Um, not the European activists, but uh, other people who help them to cross by car, for instance. Uh, of course, as I said here earlier, uh, a critique of the very existence of the border regime and of the visa regime should be coupled with this critique of the criminalization of solidarity. So the, the, the fact that there is a smuggling economy is, is, is an obvious thing, but sometimes is missed, <laughs> get lost in, you know, so in this radical uh, discourses, is, uh, part, is fully part of uh, the existence of differential borders, racialized uh, borders. Okay. Um, so this second part, which is which will be much shorter, right? I, um, yeah, half an hour. Yeah, maximum. I, it just to um, it's part. It, this is another paper that I'm about to finalize with a, a friend of mine, Nicolas Garelli, and it's about the Mediterranean Sea. But I wanted just to um, highlight some parts because I think that it interesting and important in this moment to connect what is going on on the mainland and what is going on <coughs> at sea. <coughs> so this criminalization, increasing criminalization of NGOs and independent actors have been going on uh, over the last two years, uh, both uh, on the mainland, I mentioned Italy, France, and uh, at sea. And probably, as always, uh, the scene of the sea uh, is being even more visibilized, right? So what happens at sea either is totally invisible, if you think about the shipwrecks, and it's very difficult to think about because if you don't know that they exist. <laughs> so, but the, there have been many, many shipwrecks that um, uh, took place and that have not been recorded uh, or that the authorities decided not to report and that, have, that we and we know their existence, that, that they took place only, be, for instance, because uh, the parents on the southern shore of the Mediterranean, so the migrants, or on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean, uh, point <coughs> right, that their kids, their relatives died, right? Um, so there is this in politics of invisibilization, and on the other extreme pole, an hypervisibilization of what is going on in the Mediterranean, which is staged as the scene where the border spectacle takes place. So it's a different 
context and also because it's also different how NGOs and independent actors can act, right? Because it's a more extreme space. Uh, yeah, maybe you can clarify what border spectacle means because it's a very crucial concept in uh, the border studies. Yeah, this notion has been uh, introduced uh, by uh, Nicolas de Genova, or at least he's one of the authors that, uh, among others, also there are Italian authors who use this. Um, foreground this uh, moment of the border spectacle. The border spectacle refers to uh, space where uh, state authorities, but also non-state actors, and in particular with the support of the media, um, uh, produce, craft this space as a space of crisis, right? A crisis uh, that is generated by the very presence of the migrants, uh, migrants' arrivals, in extreme condition, like the, the island of Lampedusa has been, has been one where these border spectacles, according to these scholars, uh, have been stayed uh, repeatedly, right? Uh, but also, if you think about Calais, is on the mainland one is one of the places where this border spectacle has been constantly staged by the French authorities. So the very fact of saying, "Look there," and not here, there there is a crisis. There, there is a crisis of, um, in terms of migrant presence that is difficult to manage, right? And that requires uh, a lot of effort, economically speaking, and that a presence that is potentially or actually dangerous. Right? Um, so this border spectacle has been articulated differently over time. For instance, in this moment, is very much related also to the ongoing economic backlash uh, in Europe in many. Uh, European countries. So the border spectrum refers also to the fact that uh, when if migrants are there, a problem there, there will be a problem for the society. It will be a problem for the society. Um, so the extreme condition in which uh, independent actors uh, needed to act in the Mediterranean is something to keep in mind. So it's very difficult to undertake to engage in an independent action if you don't have the um, adequate equipment, technical equipment, right? You need, in order to go and rescue, you need to have a boat, first of all, and to have people who, with uh, adequate skills and abilities. So it's a quite different, um, it's a quite different uh, space, but at the same time, as some researchers have argued, and for instance, an interesting work to, that you can look at is the work by uh, Charles Eller and Lorenzo Pezzani, two researchers based at Osmit College, and they stress this continuity between the sea and the land. So the sea is now in the, the space of the exception only, but there are many uh, policies and modes of action that have been um, uh, tested at sea and that we find in a different, slightly different way, also on the mainland. Um, but I think, I mean, I'm, I, I think that this is important, at the same time, it's also important to stress the, pe the peculiar way in which um, the criminalization of solidarity has been staged at sea. So this is, uh, these are two pictures of a quite recent episode that took place uh, in Italy, or better in the Italian waters, uh, between Tunisia and Italy. So these are fishermen, Tunisian fishermen, whose friends, uh, whose colleagues, um, have been uh, put into jail by the Italian authorities. Uh, these fishermen are uh, located, are based in the city of Zarzis, uh, a coastal town in southern Tunisia. And since 2014-2015, they engage also in rescue operations. So fish, they are not official. Uh, rescue, res search and rescue actors, and they are just fishermen, right? But they, um, as, as, as soon as, so when they s spot a boat in distress in the Mediterranean, they go and rescue the migrants. These migrants can be Tunisian migrants or can be also migrants who live uh, from Libya. So, uh, passing uh, Libya, Libya, and then they pass. Uh, uh, very close to uh, the Tunisian waters and they 
are in distress, uh, they end up being in distress, and the Tunisian migrants um, used to rescue them, the Tunisian fishermen, sorry, used to rescue them even against the will of the Tunisian authorities. So even when the Tunisian Coast Guard don't, doesn't go to rescue them or try to obstruct this rescue operation. So they have become, they have become relatively famous uh, in Tunisia and also in Europe for those who have been following this uh, event. And recently, on the 29th of August, six of them, six of these Tunisian fishermen spotted a boat with 14 Tunisian citizens, so they're Tunisian like that, um, that for us are migrants, right? Um, and who, uh, whose boat was in distress very close to the Italian waters. So what they did is that they took the boat inside the Italian waters, they helped this boat, this boat with 14 Tunisian migrants to enter the Italian waters in order then to call the Italian authorities, the Italian Coast Guard, uh, for uh, rescuing the migrants, right? Because the, the Tunisian migrants told them, look, we won't go back to Tunis, right? So we want to be saved by the Italians, not by the Tunisian Coast Guard. So they helped them to enter the Italian waters. So the responsibility at that point was of the Italian Coast Guard. The Italian Coast Guard went and rescued the migrants, but then they also apprehended, arrested the Tunisian fishermen and they put the fishermen in jail in the city of Agrigento in Sicily, accused of facilitating illegal uh, migrant crossing. Uh, they didn't ask any money, the migrants, but they have been put into jail. And luckily, uh, so they have, they, they have been prevented being put into jail and um, the trial, like the preliminary trial investigation, took place a few days ago, and so after more than 20 days, luckily they have been released. So the, uh, the, the court of Agrigente decided that it can't be accused of smuggling. Um, but this has become a prominent case uh, in Italy, uh, precisely because uh, first, they, in this case, they didn't ask any money to the migrants, they just rescued, so they saved the lives of these people, uh, and third, because if you want, in, this is the, well, the difference when, uh, so I, I, I ended the first part of the presentation by saying we have to be careful in how we depict these uh, good uh, uh, migrant supporters. So in this case, we don't have European citizen, we have Tunisian citizen. And uh, the reaction uh, in Italy has been, I mean, not so... Um, and not the same uh, of the reaction that many Italians or French had uh, when uh, the, the, the news of Cédric Carreau, of the French clothesman, uh, came out, of the French clothesman that has been accused of uh, smuggling the migrants to France, or of the, Tuni of the Italian girl accused of helping the migrants to cross uh, the French border. So it's, it's, it remained to some extent uh, more minor issues, right? Um, and they constantly they kept saying we are here we are fishermen so we are doing okay this is not our job directly but we we know as uh, men who are always at sea that we have obligation we have obligation to save lives right and in this moment they also um, I mean, they, they, their commitment has become even more explicit right so they say we are against uh, racism for instance, they mobilized last year when uh, this boat of fascists, um, I don't know if you remember, probably, I don't know if, if, if you have read this news, but there was a, a boat of fascists in the Mediterranean Sea that tried to block the activities of the NGOs last year. And these fishermen organized a protest in Zarzis to block the arrival of this boat in Tunis. Um, At the same time, so this is a, the most, the mo almost, most, one of the most recent events. Uh, okay. no, I wanted just to, to highlight what you just said and just to add uh, a couple of um, elements. I clearly remember, I guess that everybody remember, uh, remembers what happened during the 2015 crisis in the Balkans, okay, so when the Syrian refugees, almost Syrian uh, uh, refugees, almost all were Syrian refugees. 
uh, crossing the, the Mediterranean Sea uh, ended up uh, landing in, in Greece, in different uh, Greek islands. And how much uh, uh, the uh, Greek solidarity has been welcomed mm, uh, in the European media, mm, talking about white people even from the south of Europe but helping uh, uh, refugees in distress. Mm. And this doesn't apply with Tunisian fishermen, which is quite interesting since that. We are talking about uh, same people residing in the Mediterranean but coming from different statuses or being identified having different statuses in terms of a nation uh, belonging, national belonging and color. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This connects to what I said earlier, now that uh, which kind of counter discourse do we want to produce in, in face of this crime of solidarity? Because here they they didn't so they didn't ask the migrants to pay them, but they have been accused of asking the migrants to pay. So they could also now um, end up with this um, sort of crime, accused of this crime. Then finally, the, the trial went well. Uh, but it was more difficult to defend them because, you, see, you know, these Tunisian uh, <coughs> fishermen who assemble a lot, who looks like, like proper smugglers helping the migrants to do like the most dangerous crossing, um, they could be uh, criminalized in the same way that the, the, the real migrant, the real smugglers have been. So yeah, I think... Uh, uh, so this is this is the this is the yeah, reason. The fact why that Tunisian can be potentially all smugglers. Yeah. 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 Because also the, the, the smuggling network in Tunisia, the smuggling economy in Tunisia, is very different from the smuggling economy in Libya. So I also met a few smugglers in Tunisia when I was doing my research, and they are part of the villages, right? They they are seen. Uh, I, among the locals as those who help them, the citizen, right, in crossing. Of course they need to pay, but also if I take a taxi, they need to pay. So this was more or less the attitude in 2011. Yeah, well, of course my son had to pay, and so what? They had to, he had to pay, and not even so much. Um, and is it, of course it's a different context from Libya, where a um, wider economy uh, is at stake, a smuggling economy, and where there are um, uh, important problems at the level of like violence exercised on the migrants and of blackmailing uh, of the migrants exercised by the smugglers under, uh, if you want, also under the pressure of the European Union because as we will explain later, uh, the Italian government recently signed a new agreement with Libya that established that Libyan Coast Guard should uh, stop the migrants and in fact there is a a collaboration between the Libyan Coast Guard and the Libyan smugglers. But if the Libyan smugglers could not make profit with the crossing, they shift their business in migrant detention. So they are currently detaining migrants in Libyan prison and they blackmail the migrants asking money for being released, right? And this is connected to the pressure, uh, and not only to the pressure, to the actual uh, economic uh, agreement uh, and, uh, and paralegal agreements, because they're quite really at the limits of any law, uh, may sign between Italy and Libya. So quite different, not different, but you see the clash between the Tunisian fishermen and sm small, medium and big NGOs being accused of uh, having some kind of a kind of relationship with Libyan smugglers, so basically of uh, being in touch even by a phone uh, with the smugglers to know where uh, the migrants in distress are located exactly, right? Uh, or more broadly, to constitute a pull factor for the migrants who want to cross. So the migrants know that the NGOs vessels are there, this is a discourse made by the right wing and not only by the right wing in Europe, and for this reason, they uh, don't give up. They decide to cross, right? So poor factors uh, establish informal connection with the Libyan smugglers to locate, to spot the boat in distress, and uh, more widely, like, uh, generalized support to the migrants, so facilitating migrants' entrance in Europe. So this is, 
this was uh, what, what happened to the Yugen, that the, uh, NGO, NGO's organization. So this boat that uh, is really an independent actor, can't be compared to the big NGOs like uh, MSF. And these German guys uh, have been accused of um, collu collusion with migrant traffickers. So you see the different news, free event, the event is the name of the boat. Um, and uh, Jürgen is the, the name of the organization. And these other news saying, Italian authorities have proof of NGOs rescue ships colluding with criminal migrant traffickers. Uh, this took place in August 2017, this news, and these, uh, the, the, the Germans of uh, these boats have been under trial for months, uh, and in April of this year, uh, the Italian court uh, of Trapani decided that, in fact, there were no proofs of this um, uh, collusion with, uh, uh, with Libyan smugglers, but that, anyway, uh, their boat should be like kept by the Italian authorities. So they don't, they, for at the moment, uh, the Italian authorities keep uh, still under, like, uh, as under, as, as size their boats, right? Um, until now, uh, what is, is important to note is that, uh, yeah, there's a D, I think. Um, on a legal, juridical level, none of these trials um, prove some kind of uh, collusion between NGOs of any sort, not only this one, and uh, the Libyan smugglers. Uh, so in the end, on a legal level, uh, the dangers are more on a political level. So the law, uh, and if we follow the law, uh, none of these NGOs have been uh, finally accused of something, right? Declared like um, punishable. So it's interesting how the states are using the law, as I said, the ambiguities of the 2002 European directives and also the national law, but at the moment they've not been able uh, to put anyone in jail, right? Even the case of Cedric Eru ended up in a partial good way with him being released, uh, although he had to pay 3,000 uh, euros. Um, as I said, it's interesting to, to trace the continuity between these cases, but also to see the differences between the kind of support that the Jugend uh, got from activists, researchers, and journalists, um, and there has been a quite huge uh, battle at the level of media, how the media reported, so the media were pro-NGOs uh, and the media and the politicians were uh, against uh, the NGOs. Um, in Italy, uh, NGOs has been uh, called by the, the current uh, uh, government the taxi of the Mediterranean Sea, as being like taxi uh, that uh, migrants used to cross. Um, so where this criminalization what, uh, of NGOs at sea comes from, um, I think it's important to uh, retrace a brief history of the presence of these humanitarian actors at sea. And I think that is in this case we can speak about humanitarian actors, right? These are not, uh, yeah, these are like more independent actors uh, in the sense they are small NGOs in comparison to MSF, but they are not just individual citizen who go and um, uh, provide the shelter to the migrants, they go there with the explicit goal of saving lives, right? And anyway, these, as, these start to be problematic. Um, in particular, I think so that we need to trace this brief history because initially, when this NGO first decided to uh, launch search and rescue operation, the reaction was not so unpleasant on the part of the European states. So the first, and the first uh, organization, independent actors that uh, launched a search and rescue operation was MOS. MOS was a small, not so small, a boat um, owned by um, a couple from Malta. And this boat has been criticized by many activists because they also uh, own uh, radars and, sorry, uh, drones. So they, accused this board, the activists, of collaborating too much with the states for controlling the market. Soon after that, 
doctors of the world and doctors uh, um, without borders, but also other smaller NGOs such as Sea Watch and uh, CI uh, and Jugend Rettet and a few others decided to launch um, this operation. For instance, the Jugend Rettet was created on purpose. Of course, and myself is a big organization, but the, there has been this crowdfunding uh, activities for putting at sea this uh, vessel, right, to go and rescue the mother. Initially, I remember I was interviewing the Italian Navy at that time, and the day when the MOAS was launched, I was there interviewing the Navy in Rome, and they told me, you see, now uh, these independent actors who go and give sandwich to the migrants, they are like, this is a joke, they told me. But then, little by little, in 2014, they have become, to some extent, not only accepted, but also incorporated in the system. So they were, they were coordinated by the um, Maritime Rescue Center based in Rome, the Italian Coast Guard. So they, all rescue activities were, in the end, coordinated by the Italian Coast Guard. Then the situation started to change. There is no like, a, a specific date, but in 2016 already, due to <coughs> Uh, the overall European political change, uh, not only in Italy, but also if you think about so the most recent uh, electoral uh, outcomes, um, these NGOs start to be seen as, okay, as, a, as a problem, as a source, as a sort of pull factors, um, in a time when the European uh, refugee hosting system was in a state of total crisis. Because if you remember, 2015, initially the Balkan route was still open and there was this um, relatively smooth channel of crossing from Greece to Germany. Then Germany, uh, in the second half of 2015, decided to close the borders, then Austria and then all the Balkan countries uh, and, and up to um, Macedonia. So first blockage. Then uh, second half of 2015, France uh, and other, uh, also um, Sweden, um, Denmark closed them, suspended for a few months the Schengen Agreement. So there was this, there, there has been this multiplication of spaces of containment uh, across Europe. 2016 is also the year of the signature of the EU-Turkey deal, so further blockage on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean. So this provoked a sort of jam. Um, and uh, the Mediterranean as a scene of rescue start to close up, right? Uh, as a good, the, like the, the production, also the media production of the Mediterranean as the as a scene of rescue start to close up. Um, so at that mo from that moment onwards, um, NGOs has been increasingly criminalized. Uh, initially, more like the less established NGOs, like the Jugendrat. More recently, also the more established one, like MSF. And um, I think that there are, however, two important dates, treasure to remember. The first one is the signature of the Ita Italy Libya Agreement that happened in March 2017. Through that bilateral agreement, Libya accepted, or at least one of the three Libyan governments accepted to cooperate with Italy. This is not a new thing. There is a long history of agreements between Italy and, and Libya. But anyway, accepted to uh, cooperate at sea and to uh, push, so to rescue the migrants in the Mediterranean and to bring the migrants back to Libya. So rescue meant pushback being uh, rescue men being entrapped for the migrants, right, and being pushed back to Libya. The second uh, date is the implementation, the enforcement uh, by the Italian government of a so-called code of conduct. In July 2017, um, this minister, Marco Miniti, minister of, uh, of the interior at that time, implemented this code of conduct. Uh, that impose restrictive rules on NGOs for operating at sea. For instance, having the police on board, and for instance, identifying the migrants on board. And almost all NGOs refuse to uh, <coughs> comply to this code of conduct, and so they said, we temporarily stop our operation. Um, so this is the way in which 
uh, Italy that, if you remember, in 2013 launched uh, this humanitarian military operation Mare Nostrum that consisted in the Italian Navy, so military actors going and rescue the migrants. This is not to say that at that time the Italian government was good, but at that time Italy wanted to show the European Union that they were like doing uh, the dirty but at the same time important uh, uh, job, uh, fundamental job uh, of dirty job because it, 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 it's up to Italy. But um, so for Italy it was a burden, but was at the same time a way of showing the the the, the relevance of Italy in, uh, at the core of the Mediterranean in saving lives. Here is the kind of speech, uh, one of the many uh, discourse uh, that my Marco Miniti. So should I be asked whether or not a terrorist of the ISIS is more dangerous than a trafficker? I would have troubles answering the question. I would say that they both don't care about the values of human life. This is how they, uh, he crafted this discourse around uh, criminalizing the smugglers, the Libyan smugglers, at the same time that he signed this agreement with Libya that implied a collaboration with the smugglers as well. So, we, in the paper, we use the expression of governing through the smugglers because the smugglers, this is what journalist investigation has proved, uh, have been paid by the Italians to do uh, this job, so to block, because there is no such a sharp distinction between the Libyan Coast Guard, the smugglers and the state authorities at the moment. Libya is a, uh, is a complicated uh, political context, and so the smugglers are not the anti-state actors, they are para-state actors, uh, are not the opposite side of the official institutions. So smugglers have been incorporated partially because, of course, there are problems. Italy is not succeeding. It's only partially succeeding. The parters drop after disagreement, but still migrants manage to leave. So it's a constant uh, a game, uh, absolutely deadly game for the migrants, but uh, political uh, game going on between the Italians and the Libyans. Uh, so, while Miniti was pronouncing that speech, at the same time, he was the ones, <laughs> the politicians, who um, more than others uh, tried to incorporate these migrants into the, into, in, within this European regime of migration governmentality, and that pushed the smugglers to reinvent their, their own business. So, they got the money from Italy, the smugglers, so this was a source of profit, and the second source of profit was migrant detention. Migrant detention that was already there, but has uh, become bigger and bigger in Libya. So migrants are apprehended in the street and put to jail and blackmailed, and they are released only if they uh, pay. So uh, official discourse against smugglers, but at the same time collaboration with these parastatal actors. In the meanwhile, uh, this um, ongoing criminalization instead of the NGOs went, uh, was going on. And so uh, I think we can speak of a sort of, I know that this term is horrible, but a sort of smugglerization of the European citizens, so the, the, of the citizen of the NGOs. So there has been like criminalization, which meant, okay, you are a kind of smuggler doesn't matter if you, have, if you have been paid by the migrants or not, but you resemble this, uh, uh, the, 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 this, the smuggler, not in terms of the bad figure subject as a, this, the subject of the smuggler, but uh, to uh, an actor that um, anyway is doing like this dodgy, uh, playing this dodgy game of supporting the hidden logistic of migrant crossing. Um, so, since 2016, uh, the European Union has put into place a much more overt politics of containment, which of course was also at stake when Mare Nostrum was in place, but now is so open, <laughs> it's so explicit, um, and there is a, a direct goal of uh, disrupting this 
the, the, the logistics of uh, what we call in the paper the logistics of uh, migrant crossing. So the smuggler hunt that officially is present in many EU documents and in many European, even Italian uh, political documents and that is so the, the main symbol of this smuggler hunt um, has been UNAFORMED. UNAFORMED has been the first EU naval operation launched in 2015 against smugglers. So this operation was like the actualization of this kind of discourse, smuggler hunt, in order to save the migrants against like the dangerous smugglers, right? To protect migrant lives against smugglers. But actually, uh, as uh, many uh, journalists and researchers demonstrated, uniform ad did not consist in a real battle struggle against the smugglers, but just in an operation at a disrupting, obstructing migrant crossing. Well, at the same time, Italy was implementing under the pressure of the European Union uh, the agreements with Libya, and so therefore also the collaboration with uh, with the smugglers. Um, I think it's interesting to notice the further change that uh, took place over the last year. Um, so we have this what we call humanitarian pushback is an ironic way, of course, uh, put into place by the Libyan Coast Guard uh, and, uh, in collaboration with the Europeans. So why we call this European pushback, be uh, sorry, humanitarian pushback, because this pushback have been made also, are made also with the support, discursive support <coughs> of humanitarian actors like the UNHCR. So the UNHCR if you read UNHCR Libya, the documents that they uh, release, they say, okay, we need to save migrant lives at sea, the Mediterranean is too dangerous, so we need to uh, protect migrant lives, and they basically support the activities of the Libyans in rescuing the migrants and taking them back. And the UNHCR is at the port when migrants are pushed back. So when they are taken and disembarked on the Libyan shores, the UNHCR is there, they do like this uh, medical screening and then they bring the migrants to the detention centers. So in this sense, uh, there is this collusion between the established humanitarian actors and um, uh, that also use this term of humanitarian evacuation. Uh, the UNHCR calls this deportation from Libya to Niger, which is the other, the, the, the end of, not the end, but the farther step of this crazy Force mobility uh, from Libya to Niger, humanitarian evacuation, because are made by the UNHCR. Uh, so <laughs> they use it probably, uh, probably they are right because they are they are doing the deportation and so they call with their own name. Um, on the northern shore, uh, at the same time, uh, Italy and all these states are uh, using these kidnapping strategies. So since the barters have uh, dropped but they didn't stop, right? Migrants continue to arrive in Italy, in Greece and Spain. Um, so there is no chances of completely blocking the passage, right? The Mediterranean passage. So what they are doing, and this is, I think, is important because uh, we see that uh, migrants are not managed, governed, disciplined only at the level of their mobility, but also at the level of their life, how they're uh, if you want, there is this biopolitical level which is always at stake. So migrants are sides on the boat. This is what happened many, during, uh, many times over the summer. So migrants have been rescued and then sides kept on the boat uh, as a sort of like hostage, right, of the European politics that try to decide who should take uh, how many migrants. So migrants from the boats after many days being blocked uh, near to the, the coast of Malta or uh, inside Italian ports have been distributed uh, in different countries um, and it's interesting if you look at how from this minim what can be called a minimal biopolitics of rescuing everyone so at sea everybody is equal right this is the law of the sea we rescue everyone you are just a body 
to be rescued, right? The shipwreck lives. Um, then this strategy of kidnapping, of taking the migrants, produced this um, like preventive differentiation. So while migrants are kept on the boat, they are already in Europe, right? Because if you, they, they fly the, the vessel as an European flag, they are officially legally already in Europe, on the European territory. And then the Italian or doesn't matter, French, uh, Maltese authorities try to distinguish between the vulnerable and the non-vulnerable. Those who are allowed to disembark earlier than others, those who will be allowed to claim asylum and those who will be deported immediately. Uh, so there is this prey selection on the, going on on the boat. Um, and is, I think I, I, mean, I don't want to support the minimal biopolitics, but I think it's an interesting way of how these bodies are managed, uh, not just a mass of shipwreck lives, shipwreck bodies, but as already people to be um, partitioned. Uh, and at the same time, the smuggling scene, the bad smuggling scene, has been partially overshadowed in these uh, European documents because at the forefront now we have the news of uh, this uh, European and non-European uh, uh, sm smugglerized citizen, right? Uh, so we have the news of the NGOs, we have the news of the Tunisian fishermen, we have the news of that this, I don't know if you, if you have read this, no, it doesn't work, but anyway, uh, two days ago, um, Panama, uh, the Panama Maritime Authorities decided to, like, um, unregister, so put out of the law, uh, the uh, Aquari vessel, which is an NGO vessel, that just saved 58 migrants. So they illegalized, under the pressure of Italy, um, this NGO vessel, right? So currently they are sailing in the Mediterranean in this very moment without knowing where to disembark the migrants and being illegal themselves as a boat, right? They don't have any authorization to stay with 58 uh, migrants on board. Um, um, I guess maybe we should conclude. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I just I can also.